Hey, welcome to Super Social Club. I'm Jeremy. This is Whiskey in the Six. I'm Rob. Welcome to the Whiskey Ramp Podcast. It's a little crusty. It's frustrating. And it's going to be a little bit of a rant. I don't understand it. I don't know why. Some sort of injustice. Anyway, end rant. Hello and welcome back to the Whiskey Ram Podcast. I'm Jeremy. I'm Rob. And tonight, uh, talking about a couple different things. Um, first, we just want to thank everyone for checking out our Ralphie uh, podcast. And a special thanks again to Ralphie for joining us on that. It was uh, a great podcast uh, and a lot of good f- positive feedback for sure on that one. Absolutely. A lot of people seem to really enjoy it. I think I have like almost 800 thumbs up already on that video, which is a lot for a short period of time for my yeah, channel. Anyway, so. I think we have uh, well over 15,000 uh, listens or views on that. So by far our biggest uh, podcast to date. And uh, of course, a lot of Ralphie uh, fans out there. And uh, yeah, Ralphie did his thing, like just came on and he's such a great storyteller. Um, you can listen to that man talk whiskey all, all day, day long and day. Uh, people definitely got their money's worth if they agree with me on that um yeah. what did you think what did you think did you want to ask him maybe a little bit more i know i did i know i had like millions of questions i wanted <laughs> to ask him um but i mean i i, I definitely did i know i you know what i i totally had more questions i just knew that i think i knew it was going to go down that way and i i kind of knew that i was going to get caught up in just listening to what he had to say because like i mean there's a there's a couple times where I want like I was about to interrupt, but I'm like, man, I just it's fine. Just let him let him play it out because it's I mean, everybody loved him. Everybody yeah. loves him. He's he's the OG, man. Like we, we to interrupt him would be almost disrespectful. He, <laughs> right. You no, know, he's he's the guy. So um, there was one thing where we were talking about scoring whiskey, and I asked him, you know, why not? score stuff uh review whiskey that would score below 80 percent um and he kind of just said that he didn't want to like destroy a whiskey or you know like come down on some if someone is drinking a whiskey that he might not think is as quality as some other stuff he didn't want to necessarily uh make a point of saying that that you know is not good and i don't i i really should have just said like that's not really what i meant i kind of meant more of like you know, you can give constructive criticism to a whiskey that you would score between 70 and 80, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and I think where he wouldn't score something under 80, I think I'm at like the same thing with maybe a 70, though. Like 70 was is probably the lowest uh, mark I would give regularly. Like um, there's a lot of stuff that I have that I haven't reviewed. Eight because it's hard to motivate yourself to review something crappy. I I think for me personally, it's very difficult. There's things that sit here that are in the eighties for a very long time. You know what I mean? So I can imagine like if I had a 65 on my bar, like there's, I'm never getting to that bottle, you know, I'm never going to. So I hear um, that. Yeah. Unless it's like something that's like super popular and you know that you want to make a point of saying that it's not good or something like that, you know? Yeah, I think I've only reserved, I, I think um, that Johnny Walker, White Walker is the only one that I didn't actually review on my channel. I think I just reserved the right not to score it because <laughs> I, I just didn't, I couldn't give it a positive um, score. So I just, I mean, I didn't think it was horrible either. I, I guess that wasn't, I think a lot of people reviewed it and trashed it on purpose because they wanted the views kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, um, I, I totally get what he's saying though. Like he, he was worried about, I think you and I reviewing something and giving it a 72 and Ralphie reviewing something and giving it a 72 has a little bit of a different uh, feel. Like Ralphie can literally like, keep something on the shelf forever if he gives something a 72 you know what i mean like if he says yeah this is garbage don't touch it people are gonna listen and people are will not touch that whiskey whereas you know if we say that maybe it'll influence a handful of people to not do that but nowhere near the impact that i think ralphie would have yeah i think he's kind of set this precedent on his channel where it's like if I'm reviewing something, I'm recommending it to be purchased because I'm at least giving it 80 or higher. So I think, yeah, you're right. I think at this time, you know, if, if anything comes in below that, his viewers know that that's something that he would not recommend that you buy. Um, Yeah. 
So that's fair enough. Um, well, let's talk about a whiskey that we would recommend people to buy, our value whiskey tonight. Uh, we're going with the Glen Scotia, the Victoriana. Um, this is something that you've had for a while. I just picked this up very, very recently. Um, and yeah. this is my actually my first pour of it. Um, letting this thing sit. I cracked this about four hours before recording, threw a little uh, coin on top of it to um, just let it open up a bit. Um, but so far, very, very impressed with what I'm getting out of this. What's the ABV on yours? So mine is 54.2. Okay, so mine is as well. So it's the same addition. Yeah, so there are some different uh, different batches of this with different ABVs. So I got I sourced this from the SAQ in Quebec. Um, our buddy Casey uh, went to the local liquor store, grabbed it for me, and sent it sent it on its way um 100 bucks mm -hmm. canadian so I, I thought that was a good price yeah um i paid just a little bit more uh for this out of alberta i missed the boat uh on those releases um but yeah uh, something that's coming in at cast strength um the quality that glenn scotia puts out i don't think i've had a bad bottle from them yet um of course this one coming in uh cast strength and finished in uh, charred oak cast. Not sure if that's a virgin oak uh, or an ex-bourbon oak. We're kind of talking, we kind of think most of this whiskey is ex-bourbon matured based on the profile and the color. Um, yeah. Although it doesn't say natural color, so we're not 100% sure about that. It is not yeah. chill filtered though. It does say non chill filtered um, and it doesn't say natural color, which would lead me to suspect that it's not natural color. Uh, but I could be wrong, of course. We, I mean, it says finished in the finest deep charred oak casks. Mm -hmm. Could they be recharred ex bourbon? I think the general consensus is that it's virgin oak, but it, it again doesn't say that on the box or bottle. So I guess we can assume that this might... is a smoked, cooked pear bomb, in my opinion. I get in so much of that. Uh, cook pear note on here of course lots of vanilla um really nice really for like uh younger spirit kind of driven uh whiskey for sure yeah i think i think like they call this the victoriana because i i believe this is a process that they used a hundred years ago or whatever it is but i feel like this is a, a relatively new thing where people are starting to use virginal casks or heavily charred recharred whatever they are casks um for younger spirit and it's really doing wonders for scotch i think like we saw that we saw that with a whole bunch of different things octomore does it often um i, th I wouldn't be surprised if that kill karen eight that's finished or that's aged in sherry might have some sort of you know um glen Alki is doing a lot of virginal casks so okay. I think that's how a lot of these guys are getting their color. And the, yeah, there's some sherry in there. So it, you think, wow, that's dark. That must be the sherry. But it's actually probably the uh, virginal casks. Yeah, this bottle was recommended to me by a couple of different people. Um, so finally got one, picked it up. Um, first impressions, um, very nice indeed. Really good stuff. Um, so coming up on the show tonight, uh, we're talking whiskey as an investment um of course whiskey uh in the last you know 10 five to 10 years has been an amazing investment for the most part uh yeah. we're going to talk about some bottles that of course uh yield huge returns and some that might not and you have a theory um, kind of on that, on a certain type of whiskey that might see a bubble burst uh, in the upcoming future. Yeah. So I've been talking to you about this and you're probably annoyed with hearing how often I talk to you about this, but I, I've kind of run this by a few people and uh, it seems to like resonate with a lot of people. They're like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Um, when we think back to our origin story of whiskey, all right. There's a lot of us that started by drinking the lighter stuff like uh, Canadian whiskey, like certain types of Canadian whiskey. Uh, a lot of us branched off from there into bourbon. And if you're American, you probably started with bourbon. 
Why? Because it's super approachable. It's sweet. It's got all kinds of good things going on. But what ends up happening usually when you spent two, three, sometimes it takes a little bit longer, maybe five years with bourbon is these guys start to get introduced to scotch and they're like, wow, I'm, <laughs> it's, it's now time that I can actually appreciate this. Whereas five years ago, I don't think I was ready. I wasn't ready for that peated whiskey. I wasn't ready for that Highland uh, super sherry whiskey. I wasn't ready for the various types of scotch that are out there. Um, and I feel like the market is demonstrating the, the relatively new nature of like this whiskey boom. Um, and it's, it's coming from a lot of the guys that are just simply new to the game. So they're investing in what they like, which is bourbon because they're relatively new to whiskey. They got into bourbon. They love it. And they want to support it. They want to hoard it. They want to do all these different things. And what's happened is it's caused a huge shortage. I honestly believe that this shortage is finite because once these guys are in this system for five, six years, all of a sudden they're going to start to venture into different avenues and you'll always have a good percentage of that. Maybe I don't want to call it 50%, but there's going to be a good percentage of that that will stay bourbon drinkers for the rest of their life, their rah-rah bourbon and whatever. But what happens when a good chunk of that goes away? I know you're going to still bring in new people, but there's a big portion of people that are buying bourbon right now that I don't think will be buying bourbon in five years. Because it, when did this whiskey boom start? It started, what, what would you say, like five years ago? Six years ago? Uh, yeah, I think it probably started, you know, 2000. And I think it's in, right, 2012 to 2015 is when it started getting a lot of legs. And, and by 2015, it was full on. It was, it was full, full on. So it's been the last six years that it's been very, very heavy. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, like you're, you're getting all these facilities amping up production. You're seeing all these distilleries popping up in the last, uh, you know, five years. And, you know, a lot of uh, producers that have been sourcing stuff to get their uh, feet wet are now going to be pumping out their own distillate. And that's just going to take them to a whole new level. We're going to see so much market saturation, I think, in the next five years from now. Yeah. It's going to be insane how much whiskey is going to be available out there. Yeah. Like right now we're seeing prices on stuff like Weller 12 um blantons just astronomical and we're going to talk a little bit about that later but well yeah the floor is gonna fall out from under these guys i think like in five years once these guys have all gotten to know whiskey well and they're not just in it for the collection they're tasting it they're dabbling they're they're understanding what it takes to make a good whiskey yes those william Wellers, those george t stags those pappies they'll always be valuable those will always stay valuable. But that other crap is literally going to be like decoration on walls because no one's going to give a shit about Blanton's original. Nobody's going to give a shit about, uh, you know, even maybe Weller 12. Like it's 45%. It's decent stuff. It's an everyday sipper. And that's what it used to be, an everyday sipper until it went nuts and then people started hoarding it. And the only reason the, the price is going up so much is because three guys are coming in and clearing off a shelf. Right. So they're creating this demand. But once people actually, once all these people recognize that that's just basic whiskey, that demand is going to go away. And those yeah. guys are going to be stuck with a lot of whiskey. That's not necessarily <laughs> valuable. More people that try, you know, a Van Winkle 12, the more people realize that, you know, it's not a $600 bottle. Um, no. I don't and, think so. uh, yeah, I mean, I can see that too. I guess you're right. Like the Pappy Van Winkles, they're, they're in short supply. The BTAC collection, even though there's still like some decent like volume putting out, there's only so much room in the Buffalo Trace warehouse to pick those barrels from. I think that's a lot of people don't understand that those, those selections, it's the same mash bill. It just depends on where they're putting it in their warehouse and, 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 you know, the, the master uh, distillers and, and the tasters there are, are pulling the ones 
that match that profile. And there's not much of it. I mean, they have these certain racks that just work well in those, in those warehouses and those rickhouses. Um, and that's where they get that from. So expanding their line, like expanding Pappy isn't really a thing you can, you can really do because it's very kind of centered in, in how they pull those casks. Um, so yeah, yeah, those will always be valuable, but yeah, you're right. Like, you know, Blanton's, um, the cheap Weller stuff, the bottom has got to fall out on that sooner or later because it's just that whiskey isn't the quality. And you're right. People are trying other stuff and they're getting frustrated with bourbon. And let's yeah. just throw up some of these prices that we're seeing now in the U.S. Now, <laughs> we know that this is not what they go for, but this is what people in retail stores in the U.S. are pricing these bottles at. And it's just you're scratching your head. Um, but there's some states where these things aren't necessarily available and these shop owners are throwing crazy price tags on these bottles. Um, let's take a look at Blanton's. Here's one for 400 US dollars. Now this broke the record of what I saw before. I originally thought 200 was crazy. Then I saw 300 and now someone's throwing a $400 price tag on this Blanton's original. Like you gotta be shitting me with this <laughs> it's Out unbelievable it's unbelievable and i just i i'm it blows my mind because when when bourbon was starting to become a little bit rare was when like really it was just the kentucky distilleries that were pumping out the juice and but not like literally any states you can think of has distillers popping up um like production is amping up across North America. We're not just talking the States anymore. Like what happens when people start to recognize that there's Canadian distilleries that are new, that are pumping out awesome stuff. And yeah, I mean, Australian, uh, Taiwanese, uh, Indian, like all these different distilleries all over the world, what's going to happen to like, is it really going to be that limited? Like I can't keep up with the amount of whiskey that there is out there. So yeah, maybe a certain expression is limited. But when you know that, yeah, I can't get this particular bourbon, but there's seven other bourbons, if not more, that are sitting on the shelf right now that are equally as good. That are. I mean, you don't even have to look outside the U.S. Look at the Texas whisk whiskey scene right now. Look how good their spirit's coming out at a very young And it takes age. two years. It yeah. takes two years for a Texas whiskey to be good. Yeah. I not mean, even. Those whiskeys are aging quick and they're they're really good quality uh, the stuff they're doing in texas right now i mean people are gonna be looking elsewhere because they're gonna be fed up with these prices let's look at weller here's a store that's got weller uh special reserve 130 dollars. the 107 300 the 12 year old 400 and the foolproof 350 now the foolproof is less than the 12 which doesn't match <laughs> no secondary market prices <laughs> so you're getting a deal there i guess yeah um, but they are limiting you one per customer rob so you can you can't go in and clear out the shelf at that price you can only take one if you want yeah, and the the sad thing is they're getting away with it that's the sad thing is is there's people going in there and buying this stuff so until that stops we can't get rid of this problem but I don't think, I think it's going to solve itself. I really do. I honestly, I think we just need to like, after today, stop talking about it because <laughs> I honestly believe that this problem is going to solve itself. And I honestly feel bad for the people that could build a house with the amount of bourbon that they've bought in the last couple of years, because mm -hmm. out of all the whiskeys out there to collect, I fear that that's one of like right now you can buy a, Van Winkle 12 for 180 bucks and flip it for, like you said, 600 bucks, 700 bucks, whatever it is. Yeah. That's Canadian dollars, of course, but um, that's kind of what's happening up here. What happens when people realize that that's not actually that limited? There's, right. let's say, 70,000 bottles of this made a year, whereas, <laughs> whereas Springbank 21 year old. There was what 3,200 bottles made this year. Yeah, Last year there was 3,600. 36. Yeah, you know, um, those are limited. <laughs> those are extremely limited. To, to be able to get those bottles, you have to be one of 3,200 people out of millions of whiskey drinkers now, right? Like, I don't know. 
I mean, I think obviously if there's more retailers like this guy marking up all the stuff at those prices, you're going to see a huge decline in purchasing of bourbon because the reason why people are stocking up on bourbon because it's retail wise relatively cheap, right? Um, well, we're not done yet. We got more here. You have you tried Old Tub yet? It's Jim Beam product. They recently uh, released it. it. Used to be, I think, a distillery only exclusive. I can't keep up with all the old something or other. There's old, old Forester. Uh, old granddad or whatever no i haven't tried <laughs> old tub. uh anyway so old old tub i got a little bit of buzz uh in the bourbon community i don't know why i bought a bottle of it i didn't think it was that good at all in fact i would take old granddad 100 proof over it any day of the week but this shop has the nerve to throw a hundred dollar price tag on it this is a 25 dollar bourbon anywhere else you look and the kicker Original Buffalo Trace, an original run of the mill, this generic old Buffalo Trace, $210.99 US. What is going on with this? I think people are just going to get so fed up with these prices. I know that this is not what you'd normally see it for, but like honestly, like someone has the nerve to put a sticker price on that. Let's paint the picture here for a second. You're that guy wow. that walks into that store and buys that bottle for 210 American or whatever it is. You walk to the corner store up the street and see it for $40 US. How about how about $20 US? I mean, yeah, I think this, yeah exactly. This is a 10 times retail uh, that you'd normally see. I mean, I don't I don't get it. I just it's just it, I think it's turning a lot of people off. It's turning me off from bourbon uh, for sure. Well, it's yeah, I, I mean, to see. I like bourbon and honestly, I, I like high quality bourbon. I was watching and um, I was watching malt reviews recently and they did their top five, I think, bargain whiskeys of the year or top five whiskeys of the year that were a bargain or whatever. Um, and there was a few bourbons on their list. And honestly, it made me want to go like hunt them out and and drink them. Um, but where we are, first of all, it, it would cost too much money for me to get it because I'm paying secondary no matter what. I'm not finding that on the shelf. No. Uh, and it's just really, at the end of the day, is it worth it? Like, find me one excellent bourbon and I'll find you seven at least different scotch whiskeys that are just as good if not better for less on secondary and unfortunately we're paying secondary so yeah that's what it's that's what we have to compare it to yeah and i mean and that's the thing a lot of people are like you know do i even open this bottle of bourbon i got i mean we had the lcbo allocation lottery a lot of people won some weller stuff they won some van winkles um some btac and like is it worthwhile for you to open that bottle um, especially if you've had it before and you know exactly what you're getting, or is it worthwhile for you to sell it and buy whiskey that you know is better? Um, because you can get, you know, eight times, nine times what you, what you paid and you can flip that and get some other whiskey that's, you're not going to pay secondary on. That's going to be a, a lot better in my opinion. So, well, there's, there's the pushers, right? There's those guys that are just literally doing this for the money. Um, and what they're doing is they're buying bourbon and flipping it so that they can buy scotch with that money. Like, and, and there's a lot of guys like this and I've, I've spoken to personally spoken to dozens of guys that are doing this. They're buying bourbon because they know right now they can sell that bourbon for 10 times the amount they paid for it. Pretty much like the, the same day that they bought that bourbon retail. Mm -hmm. And then go buy their spring bank 21 for 400 bucks right? or two of them for the one bourbon that they bought. Yeah. Yeah. And like, let's make this clear. We're not saying this, is, this uh, does not happen in scotch whiskey. Of course it happens in scotch whiskey as well. Uh, a great example, um, the Bullmore uh, Aston um, Martin that uh, we covered on this podcast two episodes ago. Um, it was a Black Bullmore 1964 special edition uh, Aston Martin. Uh, the LCBO got one bottle. They were charging $85,000 for it. 
a lot of people scoffed at that price. We were like, that's a great deal. And whoever yep. buys that is instantly going to make a lot of money on it. Yep. One recently sold at auction uh, came in at 118750 US dollars. So the person who got it from the LCBO, I'm not saying that this is that bottle, but um, almost double the money if they, that established the market price. I think that might be the first one that we've seen up at auction. Um, yeah. So yeah, so with the conversion rate, you're looking at about uh, double uh, the retail price from the LCBO. So there you go. A lot of people are scoffing at $85,000 price tag, but guess what? Uh, Whoever bought that just doubled their money instantly. Yeah, and you knew it was going to happen. I mean, um, I live vicariously through this guy, Stefano Pelleggi. Uh, He's an Italian guy in New York. And if you know who he is, or if uh, you're on Instagram and you're following Whiskey, you've probably come across his page at some point. This guy's got the best collection I've ever seen in Whiskey. Um, And he has one of these bottles. He has the old Bulmer Blacks and the newer ones as well. Nice. Um, and he posted yesterday, I think it was, uh, a, a price that I don't know if, did we decide, did we discover if it was like a suggested price or retail price or? Oh yeah, someone was asking, that asking price. Yeah, so it was 225,000 US dollars. Yeah. And he was just laughing his way to the bank because he paid, I think, 40,000 uh, US for that bottle. Because wherever he's buying his bottles, they know to ask him first because he'll buy anything that, that they get. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it is a very lucrative investment if you have the money to throw around. And we talked about the, I think we talked about the McAllen. 72 year old the last time we talked about the aston martin did we yeah. not yep yeah. the uh the mccallum leak 72 yeah yeah like, it's just one of those things where you know like as much as it would break the bank to spend seventy five thousand dollars on that bottle you know that in a year that's gonna double yeah. because i mean it, the sad part is like <laughs> Nobody's actually gonna ever drink any of that stuff. Like that's the that's the saddest part. But I, I mean, yeah, it's just it's just an art an art sculpture that goes on your shelf. Um, yeah. Unless we, you know, we mentioned before, maybe there'd be like a charity thing where they would crack one open and sell pours um, for a good cause or something like that. Yeah. That's probably the only way everyone anyone's ever gonna try it. Yeah, I mean, it would be. It would take a lot. You would have to be very well off, I think, to be able to open that bottle justifiably and and drink that with yeah. with some friends. Yeah, seventy five thousand dollars. <laughs> it would have to. You would have to have the equivalent in money for us spending seventy five dollars or or a hundred dollars, whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, it, it takes money to make money, and you know, the rich rich get richer because they have the ability to to do stuff just like that. Um, there are some bottles that are very popular as of recent that might not be the investment that a lot of people are thinking they might be. And that is the McAllen edition series. Now we've looked up kind of how many bottles of this are out there. And I know, I know a lot of people are buying up, um, you know, all the edition sixes because I think it's going to be collectible. Um, but really the market right now, I mean, of course the edition one is way up there in price. The edition two as well, but it seems like people kind of caught on during edition three, four, five, six, and now every single person that collects scotch has that sitting in their bunker. And the numbers on these bottles, like there's been a lot of McAllen editions released. I don't think people quite realize that. So we got the numbers here. Um, the edition one, of course, it was the rarest, but there's still. 90,000 bottles produced of that bottle. That's right. Yeah. Um, that's a lot. That is a lot. And, and you know what? Let's say 30% of that was opened. That, that means that there's probably still about 60,000 bottles circulating in in the wild. You know what I mean? And right. when one guy sells one of those bottles for, let's say, 5K, everybody's going to throw that bottle up on auction and the market's going to just plummet downward because... The first guy to to the game makes the money and then everybody else 
tries to meet that price, but then is settling for less, settling for less, settling for less. So, right. um, I don't know. I, I mean, what, what I would like to compare it to is look at the, look at the McAllen 10 year old cash strength. You can still buy those for about two grand, right. right? Maybe less. So if you can buy that for less than two grand, why the hell would you buy a McAllen edition one? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I get that. I mean, I guess that those McAllen cash strengths came out multiple years. So, I mean, there's probably more overall produced um, versus the edition one that was just that. But I mean, if you're talking quality, you're talking ABV, you're talking drinkability. I mean, we tried edition one. It's a it's a good whiskey. There's no doubt Excellent. about it. It's, it's good. Yeah. But really good. We've also tried cash strength uh mccallan and it is phenomenal stuff yeah and we're talking old cast strength mccallan right like we're talking when it was when the 10 year old came out how like how many years ago was that that was what like 15 20 years ago yeah yeah those so, were like um i think i don't know when they were discontinued i want to say around 2010 to 2013 i think is when that those cast strings were discontinued yeah, and that's the no age statement version, right? So like the 10 year old, it was probably in the early 90s when it was capped out. Uh, so we're talking 80s distillate McAllen cash strength at 10 years old minimum. Like Yeah, and that's actually a great opportunity to just give a quick shout out to uh, Robin. He is a big fan of the show and the podcast. He recently poured us a couple samples of McAllen cash strength 10 year old age dated. Um, so I have those, I just got them. Um, so Robin, thank you so much. Rob and I are looking forward to trying that on a future episode yeah. for sure. Uh, thanks Robin. It's going to be, it's going to be awesome stuff. So thank you for that. Yeah, um, sure. but the other numbers for these McAllen editions, of course, McAllen does their thing. You know, they threw out the edition one, maybe as a little like tester in the market. It, obviously it sold out, um, subsequent releases, you know, you're looking at about a quarter million, uh, bottles, uh, give or take for everything else coming out after that. The edition six couldn't find numbers on edition six, but you have to assume at least a quarter million or more uh, for that. So, you know, there's so many of these bottles available. I don't think that this, you know, edition series is something that's super collectible. Of course, one and two will, will command some money. You might get a little bit more on three, four, five, but you're not really getting that much. Not no. enough to make it an investment, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh what does not surprise me about the list that you sent is uh, edition four being 300,000 bottles. Yeah. That screams to me that it's the youngest by far uh, mm -hmm. for them to be 70 to 80,000 bottles more than every other expression, every other uh, edition tells me that I was right in my assessment of that being the youngest. And I, to this day, I still think it's the hottest of the, of the six. Yeah. Uh, for the record, we're sourcing these numbers from whiskeybase.com. These are not official McAllen numbers, but um, whiskeybase has been pretty accurate in their reporting before. So disclaimer, these are all numbers from whiskeybase.com. Yeah. If anything, I think the addition one is missing 10,000 and it was the 10,000 that were bottled for, um china exclusively in the wooden box all oh, right yes there was an exclusive wooden box mccallan yep so so that's the edition one so let's say that there's a hundred thousand of the edition one that's the only yep correction maybe um let's move into what's happening with youtube a really good channel uh kind of brand new um uh into the game uh a channel called uh mark uh Lit litters Littlers, Littlers, Mark Littlers. Um, he does a really good focus on uh, whiskey as an investment. He has a really good video on the McAllen Edition Six, whether he recommends it being uh, a purchase for investment or not. Um, so yeah, really interesting, really good take, uh, great insight. Definitely uh, a channel to check out. I will link to it, of course, in the description down below. But yeah. Um, of course, comes to the conclusion that no, McAllen Edition 6 is not uh, an investment bottle. I mean, time will tell. Uh, we'll see what happens. There, You know, you look at the UK auctions, they are still getting a little bit above retail. But by the time you factor in uh, auction fees and all like that, you're not really making 
any money at all on, on those bottles. So, yeah, I think honestly, um, there's a certain formula. Uh, the problem is, is that the the market nowadays has changed things. Like, I think um, Aquavite is going to go into this on a live, and it'll probably happen after uh, before we actually release this. Um, but basically, the the conversation is um, with the whiskey market growing. People are new and new, like new, more people are coming to whiskey more than ever. Um, and we're seeing it. We're seeing the the challenge in getting a Springbank 12 year old. That never used to be a problem. That never used to be an issue or, or a challenge. Right. We're seeing it. Um, so there is a formula and unfortunately people are making their money right away. So you'll, you'll buy up, you know, two spring bank 12 year olds and you could probably flip one for 20% on the, on what you paid uh, right away, just because of the way the market's trending. Um, will that continue? I don't, I don't know. It never used to be this way, uh, but it's kind of like real estate. Real estate's kind of like that now. Like you don't, you only have to wait a couple months for, for um, real estate to go up in value. Mm -hmm. Will this stay a trend? I think it has to do with dollars in and out. Like people seem to be pocketing, holding on to quite a bit of money, but will the pandemic change any of that? Right? Like, yeah. yeah that's a great point. Like, are we headed into a recession uh, where spending uh, is definitely curtailed and it will definitely be affected in the whiskey market as you know, a lot of whiskey is a luxury product. Um, yeah. So, yeah, no, that's a great point. Well, I mean, it's like anything else. Like the guys that tend to win are the guys that can weather the storm, right? So mm -hmm. if if you're looking at buying the edition series and capitalizing next year, that's a little bit more risky. But if you're looking at buying the, all six of the editions and waiting 20 years and then flipping it in 20 years. Yeah. You know what? There's a good chance that they're all going to be worth a good amount of money because they're either all going to be drank up or, or like who knows. Right. So um, every whiskey is valuable in 20 years. Every single whiskey that comes out right. right now might be, might have some value to it in 20 years, but um, some more than others. So there is a formula I think for, for sure. investing. Yeah, and uh, check out Mark's channel. Um, really insightful and lots of intel. Uh, so yeah, definitely check that out. Um, so let's get to the Glen Scotia. Um, so what are your thoughts on this? What are you getting on this bad boy? So there's a good like what I find with Glen Scotia when it's when it's a little bit more peated than usual is it's almost like a motor oil kind of peat. Like um, a light in this one, it's very light. It's not heavy. I don't find it heavy, like a heavy peat at all. Uh, but it's like, reminds me of that motor oil kind of note that I get from Glen Scotia. Um, I had a really good single cask, a, a bottle pick from KWM a while back. It was a 19 year old. It was a sherry cask. And there's certain elements to this that I found in that. Maybe it's the combination of the cast strength um, who they didn't actually know what was in that cask, that 19 year old. So it could have been a little bit of virgin Oak or heavily charred Oak as well. Mm -hmm. It could be a combination of that heavily charred Oak with their like peat makes that like motor oil kind of note. I love it. Yeah, I do get that. Almost like a little bit of like gasoline, uh, kind of vapor, uh, S to this. Yeah. Um, like I said before, like smoked pear, definitely get a lot of that pear note on here um the vanillas are super creamy yep really really nice yep. um of course this for me is just a neck pour but i can tell that this thing is uh, a really nice whiskey if you are into spirit forward like distillate whiskey i think this is just absolutely perfect honestly i'm loving my younger whiskeys these days like Younger yeah. whiskeys, under 10 years old, cast strength. I want that bold flavor. Like I find that it was something that was underutilized for so long that we're, that's a new thing for us. Like it's new to taste a five-year-old whiskey that's cast strength. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't assume that this is anything older than seven years old, eight years old. 
Yeah. I could be wrong, but it's no yeah. issue, right? I mean, I think I'm pretty comfortable to say that I would estimate this between six and eight. Um, although it doesn't, there's the heat, it doesn't really translate to like, uh, like ethanol heat. It's more just um, intensity. Yeah, I think, I wonder if that has anything to do with the use of a heavily charred cask. Yeah. Because it seems like um, whenever they use, that seems like the solution. Throw throw your scotch, your your single malt, in a in a brand new oak heavily charred cask for two three years for its initial maturation, and then stem off into like mm -hmm. your sherry cask, your ex bourbon, your whatever. Because it feels like that irons out the whiskey quite a bit. Yeah. And whenever you place it into something else, then you're just picking up like the nuances and stuff like right. that. Um, score wise for this, what are you, what are you giving it? I'm going to go like 86, 87 for this one. So somewhere. Yeah. In there. I think uh, for me right now on a neck pour, I'm, I'm 86. Although I will eventually review this on my channel. I could see the score changing just because I know that this thing is going to open up probably quite a bit. Um, from where it is now, I can tell that it still seems a little tight. Um, but when people have been telling me, they love this whiskey a lot. So I'm, I'm excited. This is like my kind of style. I love this. Uh, to me, it feels like a majority ex bourbon um, filled cask and you can get some great stuff as long as you got good, good ex bourbon casks, um, really good whiskey comes out of it. Yeah. Uh, if it stays at a hundred bucks, it's a definite rebuy. Um, 120 150 i'm starting to like lose my interest to be honest with you mm -hmm. yeah i think for 100 canadian it's 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 a it's a where we would say that that would be a, a nice buy um you know so 70 ish us dollars or so um and was that like 60 pounds or 55 60 pounds something like that yep. something like that yeah yeah, I think you see it for on the shelf for that price. It's definitely worthwhile a pickup if you are into the whiskey, how we described it. Um, yeah, that's going to do it for us. Um, the Ralphie stuff, like we said before, we got lots of content um, from that Ralphie thing. So we'll be probably dropping a little bit more of that uh, in the Whiskey Rant podcast uh, in the upcoming episodes. So stay tuned for a little more Ralphie content. Um, we recorded for what, like almost, almost two and a half hours uh, with Ralphie that day. So... We yeah. still have a little bit uh, left to show you guys. Um, I mean, he's such, such a good storyteller. He uh, has some interesting stories for sure. And uh, make sure you check out his book. Um, the new one's coming out soon. And, and his first book was really good as well. Yeah. Uh, big thank you to Ralphie for doing that. That was, that was awesome. And <clears throat> I think what a lot of people, if they didn't know then, uh, what we should draw attention to is that that's only the second time he's ever appeared on anybody else's channel. Yeah. So he, he's yeah. only ever uh, gone on a live with Aquavite Roy. Um, that was just over a year and a bit ago. Mm -hmm. And and then us, right? So it was a big deal for me, big deal for you. Um, and I, I think yeah. for those who know, it was a big deal for them as well. Because a uh, really, really cool experience to have Ralphie on our channel. Yeah, it's great to see him outside of his regular format, um, just kind of shooting the shit and talking whiskey stories. And it's it's great because uh, you, know, you kind of get the feeling like that's how you would talk to him if you were at a pub or, you know, chilling with him on a day to day or whatever. So really cool to see that kind of um, view of, of Ralphie. Yeah, I, I think that was the one biggest takeaway for me was. Whether, whether we were talking to him before we press record or after we press record, after the whole thing was recorded, he was the same. He was yeah. the same from the moment he switched on his camera to say hi to us all the way to the end. He's just an easygoing, yeah. whatever, like, ask me whatever, I'll say whatever I feel like, and, and that's it. And what you, what you see is what you get. He's not pulling any punches, but he's also – you know, 100% genuine. And I loved it. I yeah. thought it was awesome. Just that old school guy that, you know, just sits back and reminisces about the whiskey stories. I mean, you, you got to love it, especially coming up in the whiskey game. Um, you know, you, you love that insight for sure and Absolutely. respect it and, and uh, cherish it for sure. 100%. 
All right. Well, that's going to do it for us. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Like uh, we always say, we have this available on uh, podcast. You can listen to it on all the major streaming services and on YouTube as well. Uh, check us out. Whiskey in the Six, Super Social Club. We review whiskey. Um, so thanks for joining us. And until next time, have a good one, guys. Cheers. Cheers.